Hello, my name is Alan Gray from EPCC at the University of Edinburgh and this is Learn Kuda in an Afternoon. Uh, it consists of this movie together with a hands-on tutorial which is um, in a PDF document which accompanies this movie on the same website. And if you have access to a CUDA enabled GPU, then you can go through the tutorial yourself um, and you can get started with some CUDA codes. Um, it tells you how to get the templates and, and get started. But first of all, you should listen to the first part of this talk. First of all, I'm going to give you an introduction to CUDA. Um, explain what CUDA is, why it's needed, what the benefits of it are, and then after I've done that, you can get started with the first part of the practical exercises, which is getting started writing your first CUDA code. And then I'm going to go into GPU optimization, how you can um, get your code performing as well as possible on the GPU, um, some of the techniques that you need to understand in order to get a good, a high performing code. And after that, you can move on to the second practical exercise which is optimizing a CUDA application. So you take an application that already exists but performs badly and you'll make it run faster. So first of all, introduction to CUDA. Graphics processing units or GPUs offer higher performance than CPUs. That's why you're all here to listen to this tutorial, I guess. Um, but why is this? Well, there's two reasons. The first one is that more of the silicon in the GPU has been dedicated to computation. So a GPU is a different type of computer chip from a CPU and more of the silicon has been dedicated to computation. There's many more cores in a GPU than there is in a CPU. The other reason is that GPUs use a different kind of memory. So many applications are very sensitive to the memory bandwidth that's available and GPUs use graphics memory or GDRAM which has a higher memory bandwidth than the DRAM that's used by regular CPUs. But the problem is that GPUs cannot be used on their own and they have to be used in combination with a CPU. And the reason for this is again the fact that the GPU is a different type of chip um, where more of the chip has been dedicated to computation. Obviously that has to be at the expense of something and it's at the expense of all the sophistication that's provided on a CPU. So therefore the GPUs are not good at a lot of things that the CPUs are good at. For instance, GPUs cannot run an operating system. So you can't just use a GPU on its own. So therefore what you do is you use both the CPU and the GPU and the GPU is responsible for accelerating those parts of your calculation that are particularly demanding. Most calculations have a relatively small amount of source code that's responsible for a relatively large amount of computer time. We call these sections of code key computational kernels and it's the job of the GPU to accelerate these key computational kernels and if the GPU can make these kernels go much faster than the application as a whole will go much faster. So the kernels are decomposed to run in parallel and to use the multiple cores, the many cores available on the GPU. Now, a key issue with GPU programming is that the GPU has a separate memory space from the CPU. I mentioned that a minute ago when I talked about the fact that GPU has graphics memory and CPU has traditional memory. This means there's two separate memory spaces that have to be used within the same application. The GPU has to access data from its memory space and the CPU from its memory space and therefore it's the responsibility of the programmer to manage these memory spaces and copy data as and when required. So here's a picture. So you can see here we have a CPU with its own memory and that's responsible for executing most of your program code. 
and we have the GPU with its own memory and it executes your key kernels. These are connected together via a bus. It's the PCI Express bus in your system so that you can send data backwards and forwards. Traditional languages are not sufficient for programming GPUs. They just don't have the facilities available to decompose kernels in parallel on the GPU architecture and to manage the distinct CPU and GPU memory spaces. So therefore, we need something additional to, to traditional languages and CUDA provides the required functionality. CUDA is an extension to C or C++ that allows the programming of NVIDIA GPUs. It provides language extensions for defining the kernels and uh, performing the necessary parallel decomposition in the GPU and it provides the API functions for managing the distinct memory spaces. GPU programming uses the stream computing model of computation where your data set is composed into a stream of elements. So if I look at this picture here. The top part of the picture here um, corresponds to your traditional serial model of computation or sequential model of computation. If you think of your blue boxes as being your data set, then if you want to perform the same operation on each of these data elements um, under the traditional serial model of computation, what you usually do is you have a loop that just loops over each data element in turn. So that's a single thread of execution corresponding to this red um, arrow here. The idea behind stream computation is that you decompose your data set into a so-called stream of elements and then if you have a single computational function that operates on each of these elements then you can use multiple threads to perform that operation, one on each element. You define a thread as the execution of the kernel on one data element in this model. If we can do this with multiple threads, then we can do it in parallel. Um, we have many threads running in parallel, and these can be assigned to the multiple cores in your GPU. And if things happen in parallel, then obviously they happen faster. Obviously this is not suitable for all types of computational problems. It's only suitable for data parallel problems, i.e. those problems where you want to perform the same operation on each data element. So, there's another picture, a little bit more detailed than the last one. So again, we have our CPU um, with its own memory performing most of the program code, which is connected to your GPU with its own memory um, and its own code. And the GPU has a structure NVIDIA GPUs have a structure that look like this. They have a two-level hierarchy in their architecture where they have each GPU has multiple streaming multiprocessors or SMs and each SM has multiple cores. So the streaming multiprocessors are these yellow boxes and the cores are these um, orange boxes um, within each yellow box. So, a key thing about NVIDIA GPUs is that the number of SMs and the number of cores per SM is not fixed across the different products available. Different generations of GPU um, will have different numbers of SMs and different numbers of cores per SM. Um, this picture just shows four SMs, for example, but the latest GPUs um, have, have more than that, or at least the latest high-end GPUs. So, what we need to do is we need to abstract this architecture in a way that you can have a single code that will perform well across the different generations of GPU. Okay. So this architecture is abstracted in CUDA as a grid of thread blocks. The multiple blocks in a grid 
map onto the multiple SMs. So a block is an abstraction of an SM. And each block contains multiple threads, where a thread is an abstraction of a core. So each thread maps onto a core in an SM. Okay, so in the architecture, um, we've got SMs, and we've got cores, and in the programming model, we've got blocks and we've got threads. Okay. The key thing is we don't need to know the exact details of the hardware, the number of the SMs, or the cores per SM. Instead, what we do is we oversubscribe. Okay. We use more blocks than we have SMs. We use more threads than we have cores. And what the GPUs are very good at um, is performing scheduling automatically. Okay. And therefore, if we do this, the same code will be portable and efficient across the different GPU generations and versions. Okay, before I introduce CUDA properly, um, I'm just going to, I have to def um, introduce this new type, which is um, within CUDA, called a DIM3 type. And it's simply a collection of three integers. It's a struct con containing three integers corresponding to each of the x, y, and z um, directions, okay? So, um, you can declare it with this, uh, this dim3 here. And then you've got your name, which can be whatever you want in your code. I've called it my x, y, z values. Um, and you initialize it by passing um, an x value, a y value, and a z value as arguments here. And that will create this data structure containing three integers corresponding to your x, y, and z directions. Once you've um, declared and initialized uh, your DIM3 value, then you can access the elements as you, as you do, some, in a similar way that you access any element in a struct in C with the dot operator. Um, and the different components are the x, y, and z, the letters x, y, and z. So for example, your x component can be accessed by uh, having a dot x at the end of your variable name. So my x, y, z values dot x will give you the value, the x component of this struct. It's similar for the y and z. So to give you an example, um, if you initialize a dim3 my x, y, z values with the values 6, 4, and 12 corresponding to x, y, and z, then my x, y, z values dot z will have a value of 12. Okay. Now, let's introduce CUDA. I'm going to do start off introducing CUDA by way of an, an analogy. Okay. So I want you to pretend that you're not sat in front of your computer listening to me talk but you're instead on holiday at the CUDA Hotel, okay? So, you check into the hotel, as do all your classmates, okay? And the receptionist allocates the rooms in order. Okay, so the first person in, um, gets room one, the second person room two, third person room three, etc. It gets late and the receptionist realizes that the hotel is going to be less than half full tonight. So the problem is that he realizes that um, you and all your classmates are all so noisy that you're going to all disturb each other, okay? So he decides that he wants to rearrange your room allocations so that none of you are next to anyone else. Okay. He decides the best way to do this is that he wants you all to move from your room I to a new room 2I. Okay. So the person in room 1 will move to room 2, the person in room 2 will move to room 4, etc. And that way no one will have a neighbour to disturb them. So how does he do this? Well there's a serial solution where the receptionist works out each new number in turn, okay? He just sits down with a pen and paper, and he says one times two is two, two times two is four, etc. But he's quite slow, so this is taking him a long time. He gets bored and gives up, okay? 
he realizes that there's a simpler or a quicker parallel solution. Okay. He gets his megaphone and he goes out and shouts into his megaphone, everybody please check your room number, multiply it by two and move to that room. So here is some code. First of all, corresponding to the original serial solution. Okay. So here we have a loop because this is a serial solution. And this loop is over i, where i is now corresponding to our original door number, original room number. Of course, in C we have to start from 0 rather than 1. And what do we do with our original number, room, uh, room number? We multiply it by 2 in each case to get our new room number, what we're calling our result here. So we end up with an array of results, um, one entry for each room. Okay. So that's the serial solution. But of course, this is an inherently parallel prob problem, meaning that each iteration of this loop is independent of each other iteration. So this problem can be parallelized. Um, and in CUDA, we can parallelize it by assigning each iteration of this loop to a separate CUDA thread. Okay, so we're going to have multiple threads, and each thread will execute the body of this loop. So how do we do that in CUDA? Well, in order to define the kernel that's going to perform this operation, we create a new function, which is called myKernel here. And we need to tell the system that this has to be run on the GPU rather than the CPU. And so we use this global specifier with the two underscores on each side. Okay. And then within this function, we need the operation itself. So that's this result i equals 2 times i. So that line is exactly the same as we had in the body of our loop. But now we don't have a loop itself. Um, so how, where does our i come from if it's not coming from a loop index? Well, our loop has been replaced by a number of threads. So it's not a loop index. We need It's a thread index. Okay, And we have this internal variable in CUDA called thread idx.x and this contains an index um, which is unique to every thread in a block okay um, so we can assign this to i um, and then that can be used in our operation and if multiple threads in a block are going to execute um, this kernel each of them will have a different i and in total they can span the space that the original serial solution loop covered. So this thread idx.x is the equivalent of your door number in the CUDA hotel. So in the CUDA hotel you wanted to find out your room number so you looked at your door to find out which room number you were in and here you want to find out which thread you are so you look at your thread idx.x internal variable. So we replace the loop with a function We've added the global specifier to specify this is going to form a GPU kernel. And we've used this thread idx.x internal variable um, to get our thread index, which we're now using instead of a loop index. Now, thread idx.x is one of these dim3 types that I introduced a few slides ago. So thread well, thread idx is one of these dim3 types, and we're using the x component of it. Okay. This also has Y and Z components, but we're not using these here. And the reason is that our problem is an inherently one-dimensional problem. Our result is just a vector, okay, a one-dimensional vector rather than um, a two-dimensional array or a three-dimensional array. So we don't need to use the dot Y and dot Z components. And I'll come back to that in this case. Um, okay. How do we launch this? How do we actually get this to run in the GPU? Well, we need some code that's going to run on our CPU, which tells the system to launch this on the GPU. 
Okay. Essentially, what we need to do is call our function. So you can see here, you call your function. If you call a function in C, you have to have the function name and the arguments. But we've got this new syntax in red here with these um, three brackets on each side. And this specifies what how we want this problem to be decomposed on the GPU. Okay. So in this simple case, we are only using a single block. Okay. So that means we're setting up um, our setting up our decomposition just using a single block with n threads in that block. So to do that, we use these dim3 variables again. So um, we declare these with arguments which set the x, y, and z um, extents for our dim uh, sizes for our dim3 variable. In this case, um, we're just using 111 because we're using one block. Okay, so one block in the x direction, and then um, we're not using these, so we just set these to one as well. Okay, and we're calling that blocks per grid. We can call that whatever we want, but this is a nice name to keep track of things. And we're passing that in to the first argument to this new syntax. Okay, so we're telling our decomposition that we just want one block per grid here. So how many threads per block do we want? Well, we want n to cover the whole problem size. Um, and we're just using the x direction in this case. So we have n in the x direction and then 1 and 1 in the y and z directions. Okay. And we pass that in as the second argument to this new syntax. Okay, so that was a very simplistic example and it would not perform well on the GPU. Why is that? Well, it's only using a single block, and as you learned earlier, the blocks are map onto the SMs in the GPU. So this that example would only use a single SM in the GPU, and GPUs have multiple SMs, so it's going to leave most of your GPU um, non-utilized, unutilized. So performance will be very poor. In practice, what you want to do is to use multiple blocks to use all the SMs on the GPU at one time. So to do that, what we have to do is, um, so if we look at the bottom first of all, again we're calling a kernel um, with this new syntax, blocks per grid and threads per block. But this time we're not, ha we're not running with one block, we're running with multiple blocks. So for the sake of simplicity just now, let's just assume that n uh, that 256 divides n exactly, so n is some multiple of 256. Okay, so what we're doing is we're running 256 threads per block. We've decided that that's a good number, and you'll see in the practical that that is actually a good number. There's, um, typically, in order to get good performance, you want to choose the number of threads to be something like um, 128, 256, 512. Um, so small multiples. Um, of uh, essentially it works out as being small multiples of 32 uh, work well and you'll see why that is later on. So what we're doing just now is just taking that as given that we want to use 256 threads per block. So how many blocks do we need? Well we need n over 256 to cover our whole problem space again assuming that n is some multiple of 256. Okay in the case where n is, you know, in more realistic cases, n won't be a multiple, but you can put some additional logic in here to take care of that. Okay, so that's launching our um, kernel with this new multi-block decomposition. And what does our kernel look like then? Well, it looks similar to before in that we have this part here, which is just corresponding to the loop of our original, uh, the body of our original loop. And now we get our index again from in, from internal CUDA indexes, internal CUDA variables. But it's mentioned before that the thread index is only unique to every thread in a block. And now we have multiple blocks. Okay, so in total we're going to have several threads that have the same thread index, um, which belong to different blocks. So we also need to use our block index um, to get our overall um, i. And we also need to know how many threads we have in a block, which is this block dim.x. So to get our overall global index, if you like, 
we need a combination, this combination of the block index, the block dimension, and the thread index, and this will give us our overall index, okay? And we can use that in our um, instruction here. So, um, going on to a slightly more realistic one-dimensional example, vector addition, you may have a problem that you have two vectors that you want to add um, to giving some result, resulting vector. So this is how you would do this. This looks similar to before. Again, um, we are calling our kernel with the blocks per grid, threads per block, down three variables here, and we're setting these again to be n over 256 blocks per grid and 256 threads per block. Again, assuming that 256 divides n exactly. And in our kernel, again, it looks similar. We get our um, overall index here from a combination of our block index and our thread index. And you also need to know the dimension of the block, how many threads there are per block. And then we have our result, which is what's calling C um, for each i is um, AI plus BI, where A and B are our input vectors here. Okay, so you're going to have multiple threads each executing this kernel, and each thread will have its own I, so that will cover the whole space of the vector. So a little bit more about these internal variables. So up until now, we've just showed you 1D, inherently 1D examples involving vectors. Um, we've got, we've showed you the block dim dot x. Um, this is the number of threads per block. Um, it takes the value of 256 in the previous example. A thread index dot x, unique to each thread in a block. Um, so in the previous example, because we've specified we want a decomposition of size 256 threads per block, then thread idx dot x is going to run from 0 to 255. And then block idx is our block index. This is unique to every block in the grid. So this ranges, in our previous example, from 0 to n over 256 minus 1, okay? So this means, for example, if n was 512, then um, our block index would just run from 0 to 1. So we'd have two blocks, one with index 0 and one with index 1, okay? So what if we have an inherently 2D problem like um, and a matrix addition. Well, could a, the, 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 the reasoning behind these DIM3 variables is that CUDA makes it easy to deal with um, 2D or even 3D problems. Um, and you can make use of the other components of these DIM3 variables to do that. So consider this matrix addition. We're adding um, two matrices together. So to launch this, again, we have the matrix add. Um, blocks per grid, threads per block, and then our arguments. And this time though, um, we're not just using the x component of these DIM3 variables, we're using the x and the y components. So, so both of our x and y dimensions. We're choosing here that our x component, we want 16 threads in our x um, direction per block and 16 threads in our y direction per block. So that means in total we've got 16 times 16 threads per block. So it's again 256, which is a good number. If we do that, then how many blocks per grid do we need? Well, we need n over 16 in the x direction and n over 16 in the y direction if it's an n by n matrix. Again, assuming that these divide um, exactly. And then in our kernel, so now we're passing our arrays as arguments. And this is similar to the vector addition, but we're now again using both our x and our y components to get the indices. For an inherently 2D problem, you have two dimensions, okay? You have um, i and j, we're calling them here, uh, two indexes. And we're getting our i and j indexes from our, um, not just our dot x direction in these dim3, but also our dot y. So because we've launched this kernel um, from, because we've launched this kernel using two dimensions, then we can get back our internal indexes from within the kernel in both of the x and y directions and we can assign these to um, to j and to i and the, the reason that this specifically is j which um, is 
associated with our dot x and i is associated with dot y we'll cover later okay in this case yeah, to get and it is the reason is to get good performance you have to be careful about the way that you do this okay so that shows you how to launch kernels um but just going back a few going back a slide a few slides you can see that each of these each time we've launched a kernel here we've passed arguments into the kernel okay now as i mentioned earlier the cpu and the gpu have um, separate memory spaces okay so these arguments are pointers to a certain place in memory so they have to point to a place in gpu memory okay in order for this kernel to run on the gpu so how do we get the data into the gpu memory from the cpu memory well we use the specific special cuda api functionality to do that so as i say the gpu is a separate memory space from the cpu the data accessed in kernels must be on the gpu memory so we need to manage the GPU memory and copy data to and from it explicitly. So if you're familiar with C, you'll know about the malloc facility in C to allocate memory in a regular CPU code. We've got something called CUDA malloc, which is analogous to malloc, to allocate memory on the GPU. And similar to the free function in C, we have uh, CUDA free. So, how do we use CUDA malloc? Well, it's similar to the way we use malloc in C. So we have some pointer. Um, so we declare some pointer, and this is just a regular pointer in C. And then we want to um, allocate memory on the GPU and have this pointer pointing to it. Okay, so the way we do that is use this CUDA malloc function, and we tell how much memory we want to alloc. So, for example, n times the size of float in this case. And then we have to pass the address of this pointer in um, to the call, such that the pointer will be filled with the um, with the address given by the allocation procedure. Okay. When we free, we just pass the pointer in um, to the CUDA free function when we want to uh, free up our memory after we finish with it. So doing that will give you a pointer to data to a data space on the GPU. The GPU memory. Once we've allocated it, we need to copy data from our CPU to the GPU. Um, could a mem copy allows us to do this? So this is analogous to the mem copy function in C. So with could a mem copy, um, what we want to do is we want to copy data um, either from the CPU to the GPU before we run our kernel, or from the GPU to the CPU after we run our kernel. Okay. Some terminology here, we're using the name device to mean GPU and host to mean CPU, okay? So here we have an array um, on the host. So this is a pointer to some data space on our host, on our CPU. We have an array in the device. This is a pointer to some data on the GPU that we've allocated using CUDA malloc. And we want to copy from the host to the device. We need to specify how much data to copy, okay? We also need to tell the system which way it's going. In this case, it's host to device. And as I say, we have um, these arguments correspond to, the first one is always the destination, where the data is going to end up. And the second argument is your source. So in this case, we're copying the data from CUDA host to CUDA, de uh, from array host to array device. We're copying this much data, n times size of float, and we're going in the direction host to device. To come back again, it's similar, but now these are swapped round because the first argument is always our destination, and this time it's on the host because we're coming from the GPU to the CPU this time. We're copying from the array on the device to the array on the host. Again, we're copying the same amount of data as before, and this time it's the other direction, device to host. Okay, this could a mem copy host to device and could a mem copy device to host are inter internal. Um, names within CUDA, so you just have to type these out and CUDA will recognise them. Um, now, one thing we'll find out later 
uh, when we get to the optimization part, is that these copies are very expensive in terms of the amount of time taken to do them relative to the other speeds in your system. So these can very easily become a bottleneck and to get good performance you want to minimise how much data you copy and I'll talk about that later. So what about synchronization? So when you launch a kernel it's actually a non-blocking um, procedure which means that as soon as you launch a kernel on the CPU um, well, as soon as you have code within your CPU code to launch a kernel on the GPU, the control will immediately return to your CPU thread such that it can go on and do other stuff. Okay, It will just keep executing. And this, the reason for this is that you might have something that you want to do in the GPU using a GPU kernel and something else in your code that you can in the meantime run in your CPU which doesn't depend on what's happening on your GPU. Okay, so it allows you to overlap the computation on your CPU and the GPU. But at some point you want to wait until your GPU is finished so that you can use the results of that data. So you can use CUDA thread synchronize to wait for the kernel to finish. Okay. So it's good practice unless um, you know what you're doing, just to always have a CUDA thread synchronize immediately after your kernel call to make sure that your GPU kernel has finished, otherwise you can easily have a bug in your program. So an example here is we launch a kernel, this kind of vector add, um, and as I say, as soon as that is launched in the CPU, the CPU will keep executing until it hits this CUDA thread synchronize, um, which will then wait, the CPU thread will just wait until the GPU is finished, and then it can um, start using the data uh, once it's copied it back. Um, if you use a standard CUDA mem copy call, it is blocking. Okay, so it will wait um, until it's finished. But there are um, non-blocking variants again to allow a more sophisticated overlapping. So just look at this, look at the CUDA documentation if you're interested in that. What about synchronization within a kernel? Okay, well, you can synchronize within a block. Okay, so again, you've got multiple blocks that. Um, map onto multiple SMs, okay, and in each thread, each block, you've got multiple threads. It's possible within a block to synchronize your threads, and that can be useful sometimes. Um, so I'll give you an example. If you have two threads running within your block, um, that, and you want to pass some data from one of them to one of the other ones for some sophisticated, so for some um, algorithm that requires this to happen. Um, then you can use you can do this through um, a special synchronization call uh, within your kernel. So give an example here. Um, so let's assume that we have a variable x which is local to each thread. Okay, so each thread has its own copy of this x, and then you've got some data space within um, in shared memory. Okay, so uh, uh, within each SM, you've got there is a, um, a shared memory space. So it's a, an area of memory where the different threads can all access the same memory. So, what if you want to copy a value, if you want to communicate a value from one thread to the other? Well, you can have code that looks something like this. So you could say, if thread index equals zero, so for your first thread, then you want to save your value of x to this shared memory space. So we're saying array zero equals x. So it's the, the first element of this shared uh, array in shared memory space is set to x. And then we need to synchronize. We need to wait, make sure that um, the other threads, or every thread has waited until this operation is completed. And then you could have if thread index equals one. Um, so thread index one could then read this value from array zero and put it in its own local copy of x. Okay, so that gives an example of how it's possible to communicate within threads um, in a block, uh, between threads in a block. So in this sense, um, CUDA is not quite conforming to the strict streaming um, programming model. Um, however, um, one thing to note is that it's just not possible to communicate between different blocks in a kernel. Okay, it's possible to communicate within a block, but it's not possible to communicate across blocks. The reason for this is that the system will schedule your blocks in a way as it sees fit. Okay, so you've got no guarantee about when each block is going to execute. 
So in, because of that, you don't know. There's no way that um, a thread within one block can communicate with a thread in another block. So if you need to do some kind of global communication, then you have to basically um, complete your exit your kernel um, and do that on the CPU and then start a new kernel. Okay. So you're now ready to get started with the first practical exercise. So if you have access to a CUDA enabled GPU, then um, you can first of all have a read through the PDF document that's associated with this movie. It's on the same website. And it will instruct you how to get the files, how to get the template files, and how to edit these files to get your first code running on the GPU. Um, if you like, you can pause the movie and go away and do that and then come back, or you can keep watching. I'm now going to talk about how to optimise a code so it can um, make the most use of the GPU. So, it's quite often the case that you have a code that you get running on the GPU and it can, it can be fairly straightforward to get a code running on the GPU in some cases but you might find that the performance is not good compared to what you might have been expecting. Quite often it takes a reasonable amount of time to optimise your code, to adapt it to make the best use possible of the GPU. To, in other words, to overcome some of the bottlenecks that are associated with running on the GPU. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to concentrate on what bottlenecks there are and what you can do to avoid them. So this gives a list of um, some of the main bottlenecks. Um, copying to and from the device. Um, that's copying data to and from the device over the PCI Express bus. Um, under utilizing the device, the GPU, and associated to that is um, the sensitivity to GPU memory latency, which I'll talk about. Um, GPU memory bandwidth, uh, it can be an inhibitor to have code that is not able to make the most, the best use of the GPU memory bandwidth. And also branching within code um, can have a negative effect on performance, and I'll discuss that as well. So this um, talk's going to address each of these and advise how to maximize performance. Of course, we're concentrating on NVIDIA here um, for CUDA programming, but many of the concepts are actually transferable um, to other GPUs or, or other um, devices such as AMD. So the first one, data copies um, between the, the GPU and the CPU memory spaces. So as I've said several times already, the CPU, which we call the host, and the GPU, the device, have separate memories, okay? And all data which is read or written on the device must be copied to or from the device over the PCI bus using the CUDA memory copy API functions. This is a very expensive process. Um, the speeds which these memories occur, uh, memory copies occur is relatively slow compared to the other speeds in the system, such as the speed to read data from memory within the GPU um, or to execute instructions in, uh, in the GPU. So we have to try to minimize these data copies. What does that mean? Well, that means we want to keep our data resident on the device for as long as possible during our computation. This means that we may want to port not just our computationally intensive routines to the GPU. Of course, we want to port our computationally intensive routines because these are the ones we want to speed up. But we may want to port more routines to the GPU if they access the same data. Because if we do that, then we can keep data on the GPU without having to transfer it back to the CPU. And I'll talk in the next slide. Um, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Sometimes it may be quicker just to calculate something uh, from scratch on the GPU if that's possible. Uh, it may be quicker to do that than, than to actually get the data from the CPU, even if it already exists on the CPU. So here's an example which illustrates um, what you can do to minimize your data transfers, uh, just using pseudocode. 
So imagine you have a code that you've ported to the GPU. In your code you have some loop over iterations or time steps. Like a lot of um, codes, especially scientific codes, are structured like this. So you have this loop that has many time steps or many iterations. And for each iteration, you have some expensive routine that you've ported to your GPU, you've ported to your device. Um, so therefore it has to access data on your device. So before you run, each time you run this, you execute um, this function, this routine, you have to make sure your data is available on the GPU. So you have to have a data copy from the hosted device uh, before this executes. And then you have to have another data copy from the device back to the host uh, after it's finished. You need this copy backwards again because the next time you come through the loop, you have this other routine um, which is accessing the same data. This is an inexpensive routine, so you've not bothered to port it to your GPU. Um, but it's accessing the same data. The problem is, then, that this loop, each time step in this loop, you've got a data copy from your host device and back again, okay? Um, we call this data sloshing. It's data sloshing backwards and forwards between the CPU and the GPU. And as I've said, these are data copies that are expensive, so this code is going to run very slowly. What do you do? Well, all you have to do is you have to port your inexpensive routine to your GPU, to your device. And then if you do that, all you can now move your data copies outside of your time step loop. So you can copy your data into the device at the start and then you can just do your whole time step loop, all the iterations without any copies um, inside each iteration because your data has been kept resident on the device. And of course at the end you have to copy your data back to the host again for your final analysis, analysis or and printing the results etc. Okay, exposing parallelism. So of course, your GPU performance relies on the parallel use of many threads. So you're ex exploiting parallelism within your application here. But a key thing is that the degree of parallelism is very high for a GPU because you have lots of cores in your GPU. This is relative to a, a standard multi-core CPU. So an effort must be made to expose as much parallelism as possible within the application. And this may involve rewriting or refactoring your application, depending on the nature of your application and how it's been implemented. Now, the problem is that if significant sections of your code remain serial, the effectiveness of the GPU acceleration will be limited. Okay? If you have parts of your code that are not running in parallel, then these will start to dominate the runtime dominate um, the performance as you speed up the parallel parts of the application. This is just Amdahl's law. Okay? So therefore, you need to make sure that as much of your application as possible is parallelized, is par parallelizable, and you need to make sure that you've exposed that parallelism in a way um, that it can be executed on the GPU. So this is very specific to each problem and you have to understand your problem, understand where the parallelism lies and how to structure your code uh, to expose that parallelism. And we know now that to get codes running on the GPU, um, the programmer decomposes your loops um, to threads. So your loops have now become um, kernels which operate across multiple threads in the GPU. So there must be at least as many total threads as cores Okay, otherwise you'll have cores that will be idle on your GPU. But actually for best performance, you want the number of threads to be much larger than the number of cores. You want to have many more threads than cores. Why is this? Well, accesses to the GPU memory have several hundred cycles latency. So that means anytime a thread um, makes a request to memory, makes a memory access request, it will wait or several hundred cycles um, before that memory access, before the memory arrives, the data arrives from memory. So the thread will stall to wait for the data for a relatively long time. 
The key thing is, if you have other threads which are waiting behind the scenes, then they can switch in um, so that this latency can be hidden. So when one thread is waiting for the data, another thread can start executing its instructions. And this essentially hides the memory latency. NVIDIA GPUs have very fast thread switching and support many concurrent threads. This is a key feature of the architecture. So you want many a total of many more many more total threads than you have total cores in your system in order to get good performance. So here I'll illustrate this using uh, another pseudocode example. So imagine that you have um, your original serial code has a nest of two loops, um, each going from 1 to 5, 1, 2. Um, and the body of the loop contains some independent iteration. Okay, so it's a parallelizable uh, loop or loop nest. So you know now that in CUDA, you get your code running in CUDA by mapping these loops to CUDA threads. Okay, but we have a nest of two loops, so there's different ways that we can do this. One way would just be to map the outer loop over i to your threads in CUDA. So you would calculate i from your threads and block IDs. And then each thread can loop, have a loop over j, so it can perform the full inner loop. Okay. If you do that, you have a total of 512 threads, which is not enough to get good performance in the GPU. We have to have a lot more than 512 threads. A better thing to do is to map both of these loops to CUDA threads, so we calculate both i and j from a thread and block IDs. And then each thread, then we have a total of um, 512 by 512, which is 262,000 threads. And each of them is just performing the, sin the single iteration. So in that way, we're exposing um, all of the parallelism to the GPU. We're having um, a larger number of threads, and this is going to perform uh, much better than the previous, the left-hand side, um, because the high number of threads will be able to hide the memory latency in the GPU architecture. And you'll see this as as well for the other, I uh, think most of the other areas that I talk about, um, when you do the practical exercise, um, you'll be able to see these in action, how what the effect these has, these issues have. That was memory latency. What about memory bandwidth? So I mentioned right at the start that GPUs have a high memory bandwidth because they use graphics memory. And this is one of the key advantages of them. But an issue is that this high memory bandwidth is only achieved when your data accesses meet certain criteria, okay? Data has to be accessed for multiple threads in a single transaction in order to get high memory bandwidth, and we call this memory coalescing. The easiest way to achieve this is to ensure that consecutive threads access consecutive memory locations. Otherwise, the memory accesses are serialized and this can significantly degrade performance. Adapting code to allow coalescing can dramatically improve the performance. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time illustrating what I mean by this. So what do I mean by consecutive threads? Well, that's just threads with consecutive indexes. And in particular, thread idx.x values, okay? So if you have um, a multi-dimensional CUDA decomposition, it's the dot .x component that runs fastest, if you like. So consecutive threads are those with consecutive thread idx.x values, okay? So do consecutive threads access consecutive memory locations in this example? Well, let's have a look. So I've highlighted in bold here the thread idx.x uh, variable or an internal variable. And as it increases, then the index increases, okay? If this increases by one, the index increases by one. So there, and the index is what is being used to access memory in the these input and output arrays, and these are just 1D arrays. So this is simple linear memory accesses, okay? So as you increase 
thread idx.x by 1, index will increase by 1, and therefore the memory location will increase by 1 in these memory accesses. That means that consecutive threads will access consecutive memory locations. Okay, so we do have coalesced memory access and this will have good memory bandwidth performance. Okay, what about um, some more complex examples? If we have um, some 2D array accesses. So let's have a look at this. So now if thread in idx.x increases by 1, then i increases by 1. Okay, and i in this example is being used as this index, our innermost index in the 2D array for output and input. Okay, but in C, the outermost index runs fastest, which we have j here. Okay, so in C, if you have a two dimensional array, then consecutive memory locations are indexed by consecutive j in this example because it's the outermost index which does not correspond to consecutive thread indexes this will have poor performance it's not coalesced so we can adapt it to calculate j from our thread index here so now as we increase the thread index dot x by 1 j will increase by 1 and j corresponds to our outermost index um, so, which runs fastest in C, so this will correspond um, to consecutive memory locations. So this will be coalesced. So you'll see again in the practical exercise the effect that this can have in performance. Um, I mentioned this a couple of slides ago. What if you're using 2D or 3D coded decompositions? Well, it's the same procedure, and it's always the X component of thread ID X that, um, the threat of threat of thread IDX that you're interested in. This is the, always the one that increments with consecutive threads. So uh, for matrix addition, coalescing will be achieved as follows. Um, we want, with matrix, the two is a Henry 2D problem, so we're using both the X and the Y components of these dim three variables. Um, and again in C, your outermost index run fastest, which is J here, so therefore we want J to be we want consecutive J to correspond to consecutive thread IDX dot X, and that's what we have here. So this would be coalesced. Okay, what about code branching? Okay, now it's an architectural feature of NVIDIA GPUs that there are less instruction instruction scheduling units than cores within each SM. What does that mean? Well, the cores have to be scheduled instructions to perform. And in a regular CPU, in a multi-core CPU, each core would have its own scheduling unit, which means it can do it can perform its own instructions without caring about what the other cores are doing. Okay, so the in a regular multi-core CPU, the cores are all independent from each other and can do their own thing. But not in a GPU because Within an SM and a GPU, there's less instruction scheduling units than cores. This means that cores have to operate in groups, and where each group performs the same instruction as the other cores in that group. Okay. So threads are always scheduled in groups of 32, regardless of the generation of the NVIDIA chip, and this is called a warp. Okay. The threads in a warp must execute the same instruction in lockstep. Of course, they're doing it on different data elements. This is the data parallelism. So they're still giving you um, different results because they're performing on different data elements, but they're performing the same instruction on different data elements. So what about branching? What if you have some branch in your code? Um, if thread index equals zero, um, do something else, do something else, for example. Well, there's nothing to stop you doing that. CUDA allows that, and you will always get the right result. But you will get poor performance unless you're careful. Because what happens is that all the cores will follow all the branches, and the system will just save the results that you asked for in your program. So you get the right results, but it will take 
a long time. So what you just need to do is avoid intra warp branching wherever possible, especially in key computational sections of your code. So imagine that you want to split your threads into two groups so that the first group does something and the second group does something else. So there's different ways that you could do that. The first one could be like this top example where you where i is calculated from your block and thread index and you say if i mod 0 equals 0 do something else do something else. So this is saying threads uh, 0, 2, 4 etc will do the first activity threads 1, 3, 5 etc will do the second activity. That means that threads within your warp, within your group, each um, your, your threads are grouped within warps of size 32 and you're going to have divergence within these warps. A better way to do it would just to say, be say if i over 32 mod 2 equals 0 do something else do something else. So you're now aware of the fact that your threads are grouped into um, groups of 32 in the architecture level and you're saying the first group of 32 should do the first thing, the second group should do the other thing etc. And in this example, the threads within the warp will follow the same path. Okay, so we're almost finished. Um, just one last slide to show that there's something that you can easily do to help you understand the performance, um, or at least get measurements of the, the times taken by the different parts of your code. So if you set the compute profile environment variable in your shell before running the job, before executing your code, then a file called CUDA profile 0 or something similar .log will be printed in your working directory, created in your working directory when the job runs. And this has textual information, the times taken by your kernels and data transfers. So you have a separate entry for each kernel or each data transfer. So here's an example. You can see in this example that you've got three memory data transfers, uh, memory copies, and then you have a kernel here. So this kernel has the name of the um, the name of the function which is inverse edge detect 1d underscore call and because um, NVCC under the hood uses C++ the names get mangled so that's why there's some um, funny characters either either side. Um, for each entry there's two times there's a time recorded by the GPU and there's a time recorded by the CPU. It depends what you're looking at which one is of more interest if you're looking at a memory copy, then the time you're interested in is that recorded by the CPU because the memory copies are launched from the CPU and your CPU code, and that's where you have your memory copy um, API calls and the time you're interested in is how long does it take from when you launch that call to when it's completed on your CPU. However, for kernels, the time you're interested in is your GPU time. You can see here that the CPU time recorded is, is very low here. This, By the way, these times are all in microseconds. Um, this time is low because, as I mentioned earlier, when a kernel is launched in the CPU, the controller immediately returns to the CPU to do other work or to wait in a following synchronization statement. So here the time recorded for the CPU for this kernel is very low because it's, it's because control is just immediately returning. But what you're really interested in is how long this takes on the GPU to complete the kernel. So that's the time you're interested in there. So it's possible to output um, a bunch of other metrics like cache misses etc to help you further understand the performance by having a file, an input file in your working directory and if you look at your CUDA installation documentation then you'll get more information on this. So you're now ready to start the second practical exercise where you take an existing application that is, um, performs badly and you adapt it to um, get around some of these bottlenecks that I've mentioned in this talk and you can observe the performance increasing. So again, please see the practical PDF document for how to do that. And that's the end of this tutorial.